Okay, let's get started then for today. Um, topic today's lecture is uh, graph partitioning algorithms. So um, we, we talked about community detection, and this is a continuation of that topic. Now it's a little differently. It's you know partitioning over the graphs. Um, so one big point here that the algorithm we're going to talk today we're going to talk about today are coming from actually graph theory. Um, they are precede um, all the algorithms um, on uh, community detection because these algorithms were developed in so 70s, 80s, and 90s. And um, the goal of, those, of these algorithms, uh, original goal, was to actually partition the graph, which means split nodes of the graph into um, non-overlapping sets based on particular criteria. Um, and since this algorithm actually came from um, theoretical computer science, graph theory, linear algebra, um, they usually very well structured, and there are um, some objective functions um, you want to optimize, and there are optimization procedures that allow you to do this. Now, why do we talk about those algorithms in, in the context um, of um, a social network analysis and um, community detection? Well, because though community, we define community as a group of nodes that are tightly coupled between themselves, um, coupled between themselves more than, than with the rest of the world. Um, and, and graph partitioning is really just a splitting a graph into pieces. Um, if you think about it, if you do um, split the graph into a lot of pieces, then they will actually be communities. Um, you will see this in a few examples. Of course, if you just do like sort of one split of the graph, in many cases, it is not a community detection. Um, but those algorithms are extremely robust. Um, they, they, the, the behavior is, is quite predictable. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in fact, they're like workhorse for uh, a lot of uh, things in graph theory. Um, original design for those algorithms comes back again, as I said, to 70s, 80s. Uh, where the goal was um, when, um, say, scientists would do um, distributed computing, um, the distributed computing would require splitting, say, network or graph in between multiple computers and processors. And so you wanted to actually really do, um, you know, split or separate or partition the graph in, into several um, parts. And say, in particular, for distributed computing, what was important is to minimize communications between those parts of the graphs. Um, and since communication um, happens based on edges, a very, very typical problem would be to do what's called minimal cut, which means to find the partition of the graphs such that um, you need to remove the smallest number of edges to split the graph apart. And, and this is already optimization criteria. Now, uh, to make it, for example, usable for um, numeric computing, you might want to, if you want to do distributed computing, you might, you might for example, want to have the parts uh, to be equal in size, and so to, to like sort of balance graph partitioning. And to do that, um, there are other metrics um, invented, and we're going to talk about them today. But this is sort of the, con the connection between graph partitioning um, and community detection, and we will be using graph partitioning techniques to actually detect communities. So um, we'll start um, talking, uh, we'll start lecture with metrics. Um, then we'll talk about algorithm that allows to do graph partitioning. Um, and, and in particular, we talk about, we'll talk about the spectral methods, spectral methods for finding minimum cut, normalized cut, and uh, modularity maximization. And out of these three, modularity maximization is actually a, a community detection algorithm, but it uses techniques from graph partitioning. And um, we'll talk a little bit about the multi-level version of algorithm. So just um, to get started and remind you um, a few definitions from the previous lecture, um, we, we talk about communities as a group of nodes that are more tightly connected between themselves than with the rest um, of, of the graph. And um, numerically, one of the ways to express this, like sort of the simplest, the trivial way, would be to calculate the density of edges and compare the density of edges um, within the groups 
to the density of edges between the groups or to the density of edges on average in the graph. Um, and, and if you think about it, well, you know, graph density, very well known definition, m is a number of edges. Um, n times n minus 1 over 2 is a maximal possible number of um, edges among n nodes. So um, the graph density would be equal to 1 if you have a click or completely connected graph, right? And um, if you want to define a community or cluster density, well, you can take the number of edges within the cluster and then divide it by the maximal possible number of edges within the cluster. Well, the same way you can define the external edges density. And then um, community or group of nodes that we're interested in, if you wish, cluster in a graph, um, would be those nodes for, for which um, internal density of edges exceeds um, average and external is smaller than average. Or you can, for example, find the ratio of, um, say, density external uh, density internal. Um, or, say, for example, you can look for the difference. Now, this is um, you know, it's an intuitive metric of what community is. Now, it's one of those metrics, it, the, the one is or those metrics which is easy to measure when you already have communities, and so just verify that what you have is a community. But it is hard to use uh, to actually build an algorithm to optimize something and find those communities. So just remember about it, we'll, at the end of the lecture, we'll just check um, the communities we, we find based on this metrics. And in general, it's a sort of good rule of thumb, you know, when you, when you detect a community, just calculate this um, and say calculate. It, it's very easy to calculate um, internal density of edges within the community, right, and compare it um, with, say, um, overall average density of the graph. If it's community, well, the density should be um, larger. So if you sort of points uh, I want to make before we start um, going into the theory. First of all, we'll be considering um, only sparse graphs, right? So, um, and, and it's very, very typical if you calculate, you know, the, the, the sparsity um, in a graph, which is de the density. It's usually very, very low in the graph we're dealing with. In other words, um, if we think about um, matrix, which is n by n, Right, and um, there are two m non-zeros in this matrix. Um, there are just a few of them, so you know its matrix is not dense; it is very sparse. Um, we'll require from every community to be connected, which is sort of very, very reasonable, and we'll look at the at the finding of communities as a combinatorial optimization problem. Right, so we'll have an optimization criteria, so something we're going to want to optimize when we're going to, do, to detect the communities. And we'll have some particular optimization method. So the way we're going to optimize this. Now, just to remind you, we talked about it last time, that exact solution um, of integer optimization or integer programming problem is um, NP-hard. And um, it's NP-hard simply because you know, there's like just so many possible combinations of partitions. Even if we want to do just a bipartitioning, which is you know split the graph into two group of nodes, split the nodes into two groups, it is really n factorial divided by n one factorial um, and two factorial, and that's you know very very fast growing function. So you cannot just physically go over and you know try all the possible combinations unless the graph is really really small. And um, the way to solve this, the way to solve um, those NP, NP hard problems are usually like several of them. Well, first of all, there, there might be greedy algorithms. Those algorithms, we do optimization, but we do like sort of local or greedy optimization um, that does not guarantee you to find, you know, real um, optimal, um, optimum of, of the optimization criterion. But it kind of moves you toward the good solution. And if you repeat a lot of times, you know, greedy algorithm can be actually pretty good. Um, we can have approximation algorithms, those that are um, solving an approximate problem, not exact combinatorial optimization, but some approximation to the problem. 
and solving it all the way through. Or it could be heuristics. Well, this is the algorithm that somehow people came up with. And, and, and when you run the algorithm, it actually does what you want it to do. And by the way, it also um, you can find out that it also optimizes things. Right? Um, the way we're going to use this is we, we, we kind of use the, the classical computer science paradigm of divide and conquer, which is uh, if we want to take and find the community in the graph, or we do graph partitioning, we you know, find one partitioning, which is splitting graph in two pieces. And then you can work with each and every piece separately. And if you want, say, you know, split the graph into four pieces, well, you know, you 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 split it first in two pieces, then in two each each of them, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So do this recursive partitioning. And um, as I as I mentioned, the, there is a sort of there there is a difference in between finding communities and and splitting the graphs, but if you actually go deep enough in terms of splitting the graph, you will en end up finding communities. And you'll see how it works. So here's a graph. And um, I want to solve the problem of graph partitioning. And I want to find you know, the, the best partition possible. Well, um, in order to do that, I first need to define what the best partition is, right? And for example, um, I can come up with the idea that um, I want to split the graph into two pieces, into two subgraphs, um, such a way as to minimize communication between them. Now, communication means edges, and let's say I want to do what's called um, <laughs> cut. So I want to find the smallest cut, and cut again we'll define in a second. Um, it's the number of edges that connects two pieces of graph. Now, looking at this graph, where would you think the minimum cut would be? Straight in the middle, vertical So, you know, the, the hope would be like maybe this way, right? Or, 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 or this way. Well, um, that's at least what we would like to have. Now, if, if we actually use the definition of minimum cut, which means find the smallest number of edges you can remove from the graph such a way that it splits into pieces, yeah, the algorithm would do this. Or would do this. Or maybe this. Well, because it means, you know, what I requested was just, you know, find the smallest, split it into two, split the... Uh, <laughs> nodes into two sets such a way that it will take the minimum number of edges removed to separate them. And in this case, I will just cut out single nodes. So in, in this sense, the mean cut is not sort of the best. You know, it, it, it's, I mean, the algorithm will do what we ask it to do, but this is not what we really want. So um, the, the, if there is any way to sort of fix this, Can we modify the criterion uh, to, 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 you know, to be able to find more sort of balanced partition? I mean, we can, of course, put if statement, say, OK, if one node, don't cut it, right? But you know, yeah. that, that doesn't sound like an algorithm. <laughs> Right, so one thing we can possibly do is we can actually say, okay, well, when you do cutting, um, um, instead, of just count, instead of just counting number of edges, um, normalize, say, by number of nodes that, that will be in partitions or things like that. Well, in fact, that's pretty much what's done. So here is like the four most popular um, graph partitioning metrics or optimization criteria. Um, let's go over them because you know they, they're important to understand. So first of all, uh, graph cut. Right, this is what we talked about. It's defined as the total sum of edges connecting you know, two pieces. So if we divide graph into this sort of two pieces and um, 
there are three edges connecting those two pieces, well, the sum will be equal to three. Now, if we have a weighted graph, well, it's just sum of the weights on the edges. And we found out that, you know, because of so this kind of situation, right, um, this is not the best thing to do. Um, but we'll use this for, for educational purposes. Okay. Now, there are ways to fix this. Well, one way um, one can think of is what's called ratio cut, where we take um, the partitions, the size of the partition, the cut, and normalize, divide by the size of um, each of the sets, each of the parts. And uh, this is uh, the number of nodes in the partition. Um, so it seems like very reasonable. Unfortunately, though it does help, it doesn't help a lot. And this is not powerful enough normalization to actually prevent um, cutting out small pieces. So, you know, it might help to get rid of, 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 of this situation, but still we will we'll be getting very unbalanced partition. There are a couple metrics that are much better. Um, one of them is called normalized cut, and the idea is the following. Um, you normalize not just by um, the number of nodes, but what's called the volume um, that corresponds to that node, to those, to those nodes. And the volume defined is the following way. We look at all the edges that originates in the partition and add up, end up anywhere in the graph. So what I'm talking about is the following. If these are, say, two pieces, and here are a few nodes, each node has edges, and some of those edges connecting the nodes to other nodes inside the partition, and some of them go across the partition. So what we do here is we actually add up all those edges, those that are connecting nodes inside the partition and those that are connecting nodes between partitions. Um, and if you think about it, this is really nothing more than just adding node degrees of all the nodes within the partition. Okay? So the difference is if here we just calculated how many nodes will be in partition, here we're adding up all the node degrees that are within the partition. So this number will be much larger, right? And um, it, will be, it, will, it will be proportional um, to the edges, to the number of edges within the partition. And in this sense, it will be closer to the original definition of, uh, um, of, of a cluster, if you wish, right? Because we're talking about number, remember, it's a number of uh, nodes sort of crossing the divide divided by the number of nodes within the cluster. Well, this cut, I'm sorry, divided by the number of edges crossing, um, divided by the number of edges within the cluster. Cut is the number of edges that crossing the partition, going from one cluster to another, and, and the volume is really number of edges, not only within, but sort of number of edges that originates from the nodes within the cluster. And uh, it, it consists of two pieces because we, we, we're dealing right now with bipartition. Um, and, and there is another metric, very, very popular in theoretical computer science. It's called quotient cut or conductance. Um, and it's defined um, very, very similar. Um, it's also cut, uh, normalized uh, through the volumes. But now we're not um, doing sort of inverse sum of them. We are finding the minimum. Um, We'll talk, if we have time on the next lecture, um, the theoretical underpinning of this uh, conductance and why it is uh, sort of important and, and very interesting. The, the trouble with this metric um, in terms of actually computing things is, is of course, within this minimum because um, anytime you have you know, minimum absolute values, um, they're, they're always hard to optimize. So we're going to talk today about optimizing this metric, which is called normalized CAD, um, using um, linear algebra. But we'll start um, 
with this. Um, I'll show, we'll go through all the math required to actually optimize GraphCut, and I'll yeah. show you how to easily convert this into the solution of normalized cut problem. So any questions about this, the, 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 the metrics? OK. Um, so as I mentioned, there are, there are metrics and there are optimization methods, right? Um, there are a bunch of optimization methods that has been proposed to optimize those metrics. Um, there are greedy optimization or sort of local search algorithms. And if you've ever done graph theory, you probably heard about those algorithms. It's um, the famous Kernig and Lean, um, a local permutation <laughs> algorithm, and the Fiducia Matthews. Um, there, are, there are very, very powerful um, heuristic methods. Uh, it's called multi-level graph partitioning. And if you, you know, in practice, um, want to partition large graphs, this is a sort of software package that I would strongly recommend. It's still one of sort of the best out there. Um, there are very, very cool randomized uh, algorithms for finding mean cut of the graph. And there are approximation algorithms. Um, and we're going to talk about today about spectral graph partitioning. Um, at first, this algorithm was proposed in 1972. Uh, it was sort of brought back into attention uh, in the 90s. And it really started second life um, after the paper by Shane Malik for using uh, the, the spectral graph partitioning for image segmentation. Um, they considered images as, as graphs uh, where neighboring pixels are connected. Um, and, and the strength of the connection depends on the sort of you know, overlapping filters. Um, and, and you know the, the people instantaneously remember about, about the spectral graph partitioning and, and started using it a lot since then. Um, and there is a multi-commodity flow uh, method by Leighton and Rao, um, also pro approximation optimization for the, that NP hard problem. So when we say spectral, uh, what do you think that means? So what's the, the word spectral? Eigenvalues of some metric. Some, some what? I'm sorry? Eigenvalues of some metric. Yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah, since, since we're dealing with um, uh, you know, graph and linear algebra, uh, spectral here usually means we're going to be doing, dealing with eigenvectors and eigenvalues, right? And, and spectrum of the graph, for example, um, is the same as spectrum of the matrix. Um, it's a set of um, eigenval eigenvalues of, of that matrix. So let's see how it works. Now, this is probably the first lecture. We actually have a bunch of formulas in it. I'll try to go slower. Uh, formula is not very hard, uh, but requires some attention. So here is an idea. Um, let's say we have a um, set of node, and um, we partition it into two subsets, V plus and V minus. I'll just call them uh, V plus and V minus. What we want to do is to have an indicator vector. Um, an indicator vector or indicator indicator variable will take a value plus one um, if the node belongs to one partition and minus one if it belongs to another partition. So you, you know if you think about say we have a split into two parts, every node um, will have a value associated with it that is plus one, and in another partition it will be minus one. OK? So it's a vector that uh, indicator vector. It has a length that is number of nodes. Um, some of those nodes got a value plus 1. Others got value minus 1. So if we do have that assignment, which that really means we have a partition of the graphs into two pieces, because you know, there is a set of nodes that have value minus 1, and there is a set of nodes that have value plus 1. Now let's, for a second, assume that we do have it, OK? So that, that we do have that, that assignment. You know, we did the partition. We have that indicator vector. 
it's given to us. So let's try to calculate um, the cut value. Cut value will be the number of edges right, that crossing that that crossing the partition. It's kind of cool that you can actually calculate it in terms of those indicator numbers. Uh, let's think about this. If, if two nodes belong to the same partition, then they are S values. The indicator values are equal to one. For example, then one minus one will be zero. If they belong to opposite partitions, it will be one minus minus one, which is two, or minus one minus one, which is minus two. But then we squared it. So, for in this sum, if nodes belong to the same partition, the value of the sum is zero. The contribution of that for that uh, for the for those pairs of nodes is zero. If they belong to different partition, the contribution is equal to four. All right? Can you see that? Okay. Now we, we don't want contribution to be equal to four. That's why we normalize by one fourth, such that you know the contribution is only one for every edge that connects to partitions. And we, add, we sum up here only over those pairs of nodes that are connected by an edge. Because we still need to follow the graph. OK? So the sum goes over all the edges. And for you know, both ends of edges, we check if they belong to the same partition, um, then the contribution of, the, of them to the sum is 0. If they belong to different partition, the contribution is 1. Well, if we sum over all the edges, um, that is the value of the cut. All right? Make sense? All right, good. Um, you can imagine that you know, following similar um, ideas, you can actually calculate normalized cut or whatever other cut you, know, you, want, you want to do. Um, so after that, we'll just do a little bit of linear algebra, you know, Nothing major. So instead of summing over all the edges, we can sum over all the nodes. But the notion of the connectivity between pairs i and j is encoded in adjacency matrix. So adjacency matrix is 1 if the nodes connected and 0 if they're not. And it's 1, 8 because you know, if, if we do i, j, we'll double sum for both ends of the, of the edge. OK. Then the next step is, well, this is squared. So we can open up this squared. It's going to be s squared minus uh, 2 si as j plus as j squared, right? So it's si squared uh, minus 2 si as j plus s o plus s j squared, right? So um, and since it goes under the summation of i and j, um, it doesn't matter whether we use i or j. Uh, in terms of indices, you know, you can just leave twice as i, um, and we have tw twice as i as j, so number two goes out and becomes again one fourth. Um, and then I just want to remind you that if we have summation a i j, and for example, we sum over a j, and this is a adjacency matrix, uh, what we're actually doing is we're summing uh, all the all the elements in all the columns per row, and that means this is the um, degree of the node i. We, we we looked at that formula before, right? So what I'm saying is, here's the matrix, and we're just summing ac across the rows, and the sum across the rows is a degree, um, degree of the node. Okay, and that's where this comes from. Um, if I want to keep summation over both indexes, I need to keep delta ij, uh, which is a Kronecker symbol. And you know we talked already about si squared. So that's pretty much it. All right? Then we can factor this out a little bit. And that's what we got. All right, let me clean this. 
Um, okay. All right. So this is what we have. And um, AIJ <laughs> is a JSONC matrix. Delta IJ is a you know, delta symbol, Kronecker delta symbol, but um, it's also uh, a diagonal matrix, right? It's diagonal matrix of ones. Well, because it just says um, it, it's zero everywhere except for the diagonal. And uh, times KI, it means we'll just scale the diagonal. So this is a matrix. This is a matrix. These, these are these two matrices. Ki times delta ij is usually called d capital ij. It's a diagonal matrix of no degrees. Um, Aij is adjacency matrix. And so we can write the cut as this uh, linear combination where si is an indicator vector, um, sj indicator vector, um, dij minus um, aij, um, those matrices. And so if this indicator vector takes pl values plus one and minus one, depending on you know, where a node belongs to, well, the, this actually computes the value of the cut. So it is a you know, linear algebra way to compute the value of the cut instead of just going through every node and, and you know, or through every edge and thinking, OK, well, if the left end of the edge belongs to one partition and the right end of the edge belongs to another partition, you can actually write it this way through indicator. All right, so let's take a look, let's take a closer look at this matrix. It's actually called graph Laplacian. Um, and uh, here's a definition. If you think about it, what it says is the following. Um, this matrix has minus ones everywhere where our original adjacency matrix had ones, sort of connections. It has no degrees on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. If, for example, I have my graph looks like this, you know, just very, very generous sort of straight line graph, this Laplacian matrix has the following form. Now, how many of you guys have seen this type of matrices before? OK, where have you seen them? Numerical methods. Numerical yeah. methods. Uh, OK, what did you do with those types of matrices and numerical methods? Just the second numerical derivative. It is a second derivative, right? It's actually a finite difference method, right? If you remember, you probably did something like that. Here is our grid, OK? And we want to calculate, say, derivative at this point. And derivative at this point will uh, depend on the nearest neighbors, right? right? And if you have a grid, it will be, for example, uh, 4 minus um, you know, 4 value here minus so it's x i j minus x i uh, minus one j, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So minus sort of nearest neighbors, right? And if you want to do second derivative, you can also do it very similar in, in very similar fashion. So the point is that Laplacian matrix is called Laplacian not by an accident. It's actually a discrete representation of a Laplacian operator, right? Which is um, second derivative. And this is a generalization for the case when you go from regular grid to irregular graph. Because in a regular grid, you will always have minus ones, twos, and ones, or it will be minus one, minus one, four, minus one, minus one, um, things like that. Because it always has the same number of neighbors. In the graph, what we're going to have, this will tell you the connectivity structure, neighbors. And, and this will tell you the degree or how many neighbors the node has. So Laplacian matrix is a generalization of uh, you know, Laplacian operator onto the world of graphs. Right? And that's why it's called graph Laplacian. 
so the intuition in the sense, uh, you know, in many cases will come from physics. Any questions about this? And um, what about the first and the last row? It's kind of boundary condition. But it, it adds up right now, yeah, because it's boundaries. Um, what, what we need from this matrix is that per row, it adds up to zero, right? Um, this is the degree of the node. And, and this is the one connection it has. So there is nothing wrong here. OK. So the question you probably might have is like, what these derivatives have to do with you know, what we're trying to achieve, and why, why there are derivatives here, and, and why um, graph partitioning? Um, the, you know, the magic will happen on the next few slides. Um, but I'll give you sort of very quick um, I idea. Think for a second about an oscillate about a string, right? You have a string. Uh, let's and, and this is sort of very very, you know, sort of hand wavy explanation. But you will see how, where it comes from. Imagine that this is a sort of classical problem. Right, you have a string of masses with two ends fixed. Now, what do you know about the sort of the motion? And let's say it can oscillate. Let's say it can go, you know, up and down. And and this is a very simple example where masses are in the points, but you can think about them being distributed. And so it's, you know, a string that fixed between two um, fixed points. Have you ever considered the motion of this string in, in whatever courses? I'm sure you did, right? right. Differential equations, so where did you do that? OK, so how would this sort of, what are the modes for this string? Remember that it has modes of oscillation. Do you remember what they look like? Yes. Like the harmonics? Yes. Guitar strings? Zero. So there will be like, OK, there is this, this is the first harmonic, right? Half of the waves, wavelength. Then this is the second harmonic, right? And then you can go further and further away. Now, um, I'm not going to talk any more about it, but just remember this. Um, especially this picture, the sort of second harmonic. We'll get back to this a little later. Okay, so now I just want to remind you that we calculated this, this cut. Um, so we, we can calculate it if we're given this S vector. So if somebody tells us, okay, well, this is your sort of assignment for node, node assignment, um, vector, then you can easily calculate the value of the cut. But, but you know, normally it's going to be the other way around. So um, you want to calculate that assignment vector. So uh, looking back, one slide back through this mess, um, we have we expressed cut in terms of this summation. Double sum. So there is one matrix, Lij, Si, Sj. You can write this double sum as a matrix vector multiplication. And here it is. Looks much nicer. Right? Just remember that L is the matrix D minus A. And here is our vector S, vector S. Now, this is a matrix. So what we do is this is a matrix. This is one vector S. Um, this is another vector S. So um, what we end up ha having is, as a result of this product, is a scalar, right? Okay. Um, which is the, you know, the value of the cut. Well, what we want to do is we want to find those values S 
that minimize Q, or minimize cut. Now, in fact, I don't want just sort of any values of S. Let's say uh, I have this graph and I want to split it into two pieces, and I want um, to have approximately equal size of the partitions. So I want you know, number of plus ones and minus ones to be approximately equal. Since we're dealing again with sort of integer optimization problem, I can just request equality for right now. And to do that, I can say, okay, well, let's make all this SI adds up to one. I'm sorry, add, add up to zero, right? Now you can say, oh, well, well what if it's uh, not, what if it's odd number? Just, you know, for a sec, bear with me. Let's say, um, you know, the even number of, of nodes, we can split them exactly into two pieces of equal size. We're going to relax this constraint. Now, this is all great. The only problem is, you know, we, we change the notations, we change the language. Uh, what hasn't changed is the fact that this is an p-hard problem, right? I mean, it would be great if by changing notation we can solve in p-hard. Um, it, it's still factorially large number of combinations um, that requires you to solve this problem, right? Um, I mean, in some sense, this n factorials, it's very easy to see from, from, uh, from this vector. Think about it. If you do the vector s that consists of plus ones and minus ones, and um, I, I need to, in order to find the optimum, like real optimum, I need to go through all the possible assignments of plus ones and, and plus ones and minus ones for every node. So pretty much the way to think about it is, well, one way to think about it is you need to, um, for, for every value, you know, it, it's a binary value, it can be either plus one or minus one. Um, and you can imagine that it's two to the n if you do not fix the, the, the size of the partition, how many ways to actually construct this vector. If we fix sizes of the partition to be, let's say, n over two, then it is n factorial because n factorial ways to um, set up plus ones and minus one in, in one line. There is n factorial ways to do this. And within each plus one and within each minus one, we can sort of inter we can change their positions. Um, it doesn't matter because they're indistinguishable. All plus ones are indistinguishable from all other plus ones. So it's going to be n over 2 factorial and n over 2 factorial. So that's a total number of this s vectors we need to go over to actually find this optimum. So it's not doable. In this sense, it's not solvable, right? So we are stuck if we want to do this exactly. And, and here where the sort of the, the main idea that Fiedler proposed in, in 70s comes in. Um, the idea is the following. Let's relax this problem. And relaxation will come in the form of, of, of the following. You know, let's not bother solving integer programming optimization. Let's, instead of finding S that can take on the values 0, 1, let's relax this and rewrite the same equation in terms of x that can take any real value. So let's solve, we cannot solve the exact problem, it's in p-hard, let's solve the problem we can solve. It's approximate problem, it's not the same problem, it's approximation, but we can solve it. And so that's the idea. Go from a discrete problem that it is NP-hard to a continuous problem that is solvable. It's an approximation, but you know, it, it's something we can solve. So instead of doing this, we're going to be doing that. There are some constraints that are involved. So first of all, I don't want my vector x to become you know, very large or very small. And so uh, I want to fix it length by adding up xi squared to be equal to n. Why n? Well, because um, the sum of all si squared is equal to n. Hsi is, is, um, is 1 or minus 1. And this comes from the sort of the idea of balanced partition. And then the idea is the following. After we compute those xi's, 
we're just going to round them up to become SIs. Now, this is the most sort of frivolous and arbitrary step in, in the whole story. Why would it be uh, just a sign? Well, um, there are a lot of sort of ideas why you can ex how you can explain this. I, I probably the best one is that it actually works, right? But if you think about this, what we're doing is the following. Let's say we have a two-dimensional world. Vector S consists only of two values, right? S can, it's only two nodes. So two positions, say one plus, either one and minus one. So here's the axis S1, S2. So we can either both have them to be one and one, or it could be um, one and minus one, or minus one. Uh, minus one or this one. So there are four possible sort of points, four possible values um, S's can take. What we're doing right now is instead of being, instead of computing those S's, we're saying, okay, well, let's do this. Let's compute continuous values and um, we'll restrict those continuous values so um, they will belong to this uh, circle. So it's going to be x1 squared plus x2 squared is equal to uh, square root of 2. So what we're doing is our solution, instead of being those four corners, will actually live somewhere on, on this circle, at the point that minimizes this. And so assuming that we found our solution to be here, we then project it to this point. Assuming that solution we found is here, we'll project it onto this point. That's what this operation would do. All right? Now, um, this actually causes some problems. But this is the price we're paying for solving NP-hard problem. Right? So, we, we, so what we're doing is we're solving not exactly graph partitioning problem, we're solving an approximation to graph partitioning problem. But the good news is that we can solve it. Um, it. It takes some time to get used to this. But let's say, oh, actually, I shouldn't go there. Uh, if you have, guys, this problem, uh, optimization problem under the constraint, how do you solve that? What's the sort of the standard way to do this? So now we are not in in integer domain. It's real valued. So how do you solve you know real valued constraint optimization problem? We use constraint optimization techniques with Lagrange multipliers and such. Exactly. So it's Lagrange multipliers, right? And I'm sure you've done it somewhere. Um, everywhere. Everywhere. Exactly. So what we do is we just do Lagrange multipliers, right? So this is an optimization function we want to solve. Um, and this is a Lagrange multiplier for one of the constraints. I'm not going to put the second one in. I'll just keep it outside. You'll see in a second one. Um, do derivatives, you know, equate it, you will get um, eigenvalue problem. Now, here is an important point. Let's say x is a solution, xi is a solution of eigenvalue problems. So lambda xi is equal lambda i xi. Um, substituting it back in here, this xi, you can calculate the value of, of q or the value of the cut. And you know, it's clear that if we're looking for a minimum cut, smallest cut, we need to take the smallest eigenvalue, right? Now, the matrix is symmetric, <coughs> and um, all, uh, so the matrix is symmetric, right? And uh, for this matrix, and it's uh, row sums to one, for this matrix, one can show 
that all eigenvalues um, will be non-negative. And the smallest one is actually equal to 0. Um, how can we see that the smallest one is equal to 0? Well, it actually can be easily seen by the fact that the vector of all ones is an eigenvector. Well, let's go back. Um, where was it? Here. Um, I'll clear the page. Let's look at this matrix. The Laplacian matrix is designed such a way that on the diagonal, we put the node degrees. And of the diagonal, there are all sort of edges. But the number of edges is, of course, equal the node degree. So if you take this matrix and multiply by the vector of all ones, what's going to be? What's going to happen? Well, the vector times the first row, 0, times the second row, 0, 0, 0, 0. So what does it tell you about the vector of ones? It's an eigenvector of this matrix that corresponds to eigenvalue 0. OK? Now, that's not a sort of magic or miracle. It's just by design. Uh, because we actually placed the way we, we build this is, again, remember, um, matrix D is just diagonal um, of, of the node decrease. And uh, this just tells us how many neighbors every node has. Um, and, and so the total sum of those neighbors is a node degree. So yeah, that, that's the way it should be. OK. Because of that, um, because you know, the, the, the eigenvector of 1, 1, 1 is really not interesting to us, it really tells us that all the nodes belong to one partition. Remember, uh, this eigenvector has a meaning of indication, indicator vector. And if it all consists of ones, it means all the nodes belong to one partition. So it's a trivial solution. It's not interesting. So we need to look for the second smallest eigenvalue. All right? right. And the second smallest eigenvector, or eigenvector that corresponds to the second smallest eigenvalue. It's actually this eigenvector is called Fiedler, Fiedler vector by the name of the guy who invented this technique, um, Stislav Fiedler. And um, the way to formulate it is the following. We're solving for uh, second smallest eigenvalue and second smallest eigenvector. It can also be formulated, and uh, you know, if you if you remember a little bit from linear algebra, as a minimization of what's called Rayleigh-Ritz quotient, um, which is really the same sort of problem as here, uh, but I'm just doing it uh, with a constraint that vector should be orthogonal to the very first eigenvector which really just a different way to say that we're looking for the second eigenvector. So the bottom line, what we're trying to do is we're trying to solve optimization problem. Um, to do this, we're looking for um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of Lagrange multiply, of Lagrange matrix, um, graph, uh, I'm sorry, of um, graph Laplacian, of Laplace matrix. We do it through Lagrange multipliers. And um, the first eigenvector is constant. And the first eigenvalue is 0. And so we're looking for the second eigenvalue and second eigenvector. Second smallest eigenvalue, second smallest eigenvector. Now, um, this is a piece of uh, spectral graph theory. There are like books and courses on that. And they're actually very, very sort of fascinating um, theory that connects um, you know, graph properties with um, uh, properties of, of eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix. And just sort of few um, examples from that theory is, um, you know, if you take, a, um, if you take a, you know, adjacency matrix, dual Laplacian matrix, um, then, you know, lambda 1 is equal to 0 always. And in fact, the number of 0 eigenvalues in the matrix is actually equal to the number of connected components. So this is one of the ways to actually finding connected components. Maybe it's not the most efficient way to find connected components, but it, it does work, right? And you can verify. If you're, for example, doing 
eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and you find a bunch of eigenvalues equal to zero, it means you have a disconnected graph. Um, there is another interesting property is that lambda 2 is equal to 1 only for totally connected graph. This is also quite important because that really means that the second eigenvalue can, can actually act as a, as a sort of indicator variable, well, as an indicator of the connectivity of the graph. When everything is connected is 1. When uh, it's a disconnected graph, it's 0. And so which means um, you, you, it, it can judge you sort of the density of the graph. And you can, there are even estimates for the graph diameter through the second eigenvalue. So there are a lot of interesting things out there. It's a little far beyond our course, but if you're interested, um, take a look. So for us, what's important is this algorithm. It's called spectral graph partitioning. And um, it, it, it's sort of the generic way to solve those type of problems. So what do we do? We have a JCNC matrix A, and we have some class indicator vector uh, S. So what we do? First, we compute diagonal matrix D, which is diagonal matrix of the degrees of the matrix A. Then we compute Laplacian matrix. And then we solve for second smallest eigenvector. Now, what we have shown is this. It's a minimum cut problem. Um, you can take my word for it, or actually try and go through the algebra. And you can show that if we're optimizing not the cut, but normalized cut, so we're actually normalizing by the number of outgoing um, edges within each and every partition, the only change you need to do is from um, regular eigenvalue problem go to the so-called generalized eigenvalue problem, where D appears on the right also. So we compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We take second smallest eigenvector, and we set indicator to be the sign of the values in the second smallest eigenvector. And that will give us partition of the graph into pieces. Now, compared to, say, graph partitioning algorithms and community detection algorithm we talked about last time and what Andre will talk about today, this looks like, wow. I mean, this is, you know, there's a lot of mathematics um, and not clear at first why we even bothered to do this. Well, there are several reasons. First of all, it does have very well-defined conversion properties. Um, it's quite general. And in fact, it is quite scalable uh, because you can, in fact, finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors for sparse matrices quite efficiently. There's like you know, 30 years of research in the algebra that allows you to do this. Now, um, do you know what, what method to use? Um, well, aside from just calling MATLAB eigenvalues, um, to actually find eigenvalues, eigenvectors of large matrices, especially if you want just one or two of them. Just, you know, if, if you know, speak it up because I cannot hear you. <laughs> you can use uh, iterations. Power iterations, right? Yeah, so you can use power iterations. Usually power iterations, if you have a spectrum of the matrix, um, this is sort of the spectrum for lambda min, lambda max. Power iterations allows you to find either uh, values around maximum, or you can actually just do inverse of, of it and finding values around um, smallest eigenvector. And so if you're, and, and then you can sort of move that way if you want to, but it is very, very efficient. It only requires matrix vector multiply. And it usually converges pretty fast. In fact, the convergence depends on the ratio of lambda 2 to lambda 1. So uh, in this case, lambda 3 to lambda 2. So there, there are ways to do this. Now, you know, because there is so much, so much math in here, I just want to give you a like, quick example of how this works. Oh, and by the way, the reason for that is because I want you guys, this will be next, your, your next homework to implement this, this algorithm. Um, this is the same uh, um, Zachary Club graph we looked at last time. 
this is an eigenvalues for Laplacian matrix of this graph. Can you see them? Can you see the dots? Yes. Okay, good. So this one, if you notice, it says zero here. So this is the last eigenvalue, which is zero. So it's you know everything is according to to the mathematics. So we're actually interested in this guy. So this is a small second smallest eigenvalue. It's non-zero. We don't have to compute everything else. It's just you know, I'm also lazy. I just just called Ig's function. Now this is a second eigenvector. So what's shown here is the following. Here on, 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 the, on the horizontal axis, just a node number. You know, if you think about this eigenvector x, it's an eigenvector that consists of numbers, right? So <coughs> um, every number here is a position. Uh, it, it corresponds to some node. And so, for example, um, the value of second eigenvector on the 10th node is right here. And say on the 30th node, it's this value. Uh, on the 20th node, this value, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, again, per node in the graph, we compute some label. In this case, it's real value. It's second eigenvector. So based on our theory, and when, I have, when we have those, those numbers, how can we do graph partitioning? So what do we need to do? So what we can say is the following. Hey, like here is zero, right? Remember, we said S, which is indicator vector that takes plus minus one, is sine of, of, of X, right? And so what I can say is, oh, well, let's take all the values that are below zero. So all the nodes that have these values will belong to one partition. And all nodes that have second eigenvalue above zero will belong uh, will belong to the second partition. Now, this is not a very fair example because the way nodes were numbered are also a little bit hinting us on, on the way the partitioning is going to happen. But still, um, that's what we have. So if I do. Uh, just this, uh, you know, that's a split. All right. Any questions about how this happened? Is this clear? Okay. Good. Well, you can actually do something more interesting with this. So this is a second eigenvector. And you know, really looking at this picture, you don't see a lot. But let's say I sort this eigenvector, right? So I can take this value, this values, and just sort it. Now, sorting means permuting vertices. So I'll just change the places for the vertices such a way that eigenvector will be sorted. See what happens? So this was before. Now I am just sorting them. Again, I'm sorted, sorted. All right. Now, if you look at this now, you realize, wow, you can actually see the, the graph cut. There is a huge gap here. These guys are below zero, right? These are above, and there is a gap there. So it's a very clean cut. So if you can sort eigenvec eigenvector, you will see those gaps. Those gaps are actually corresponding to clusters, right? Uh, now, what happened is because now I permuted nodes, I collected all the nodes that has the values below zero on the left, and above zero on the right. 
So this is a one partition. So the partition minus one or sort of V minus. This is a partition V plus. So now these nodes are renumbered. These nodes belong to one partition. That node belongs, these guys belong to another partition. Um, there is another observation here I can probably make is that, oh, there is probably another cut that is possible in, in, in the graph. Now, the theory doesn't tell us that we can use it, um, but in fact, we can. So to convince you that, that this sort of, the, this procedure eliminates graphs, uh, partitioning in the graph, um, here, here is some thought. Imagine that, you know, so what we're doing in, in some sense um, is the following. We are minimizing this thing, right? Um, let's think about a little bit about physics, just for a second. Um, would this, does this formula remind you about something in physics? Do you remember this kind of problem? Or, or, yeah, the, the oscillators and the springs. Um, there is a law that, that, that actually they are bay. What's law? What's called? Do you mean that uh, uh, it's a Lagrangian for the system or something? Uh -huh. Yeah, it is actually Lagrangian for, um, for, for, for the system of uh, coupled oscillators. Um, what I was trying to get into that there is a Hooke's law which, which says that there is k delta x, the force is proportional, and the energy is proportional to kx squared over 2. Actually, k delta x squared. And um, delta x is uh, coordinates of 1 minus coordinates another squared. So this is, in fact, an energy for the system of oscillators that are connected. And here is a question for you guys. If you have this type of a system um, and you let it sort of go to, you know, the system tends in physics go always to minimum energy stage. So what would the system want to do in terms of how would it want to position nodes that are connected? they'll want them to get clo as close as possible. Because if they're far away and they're connected by springs, there is high energy um, will be accumulated in that spring. So you want to reduce that energy. You want to put connected nodes close to each other. So in fact, what we're doing in, in, in this optimization, we are sort of embedding those system of, of masses connected by springs into, on, onto one dimensional line. And if we do that, and if we do it right, those that are connected to each other, they'll try to position on this line close to each other to minimize that energy. And, and we talked about that, that, that graph partitioning really means finding the sort of this, the, the place where <coughs> there's the smallest number of connections. And so what's going to happen is those nodes that are connected to each other, um, they will be sort of mapped into the close uh, nearby locations and nearby locations. And that means if we, for example, take this permutation vector and permute the matrix being based on that vector, we'll see some patterns in the matrix. What, what I a question? Uh, Speak it up, I'm sorry. Yes, um, uh, I have a question. Uh, you said that we should position um, you know, this, uh, this masses uh, on, on uh, straight line, but I don't understand. How we can do it, for example, for triangle graph. No. Uh, uh, we have, for example, a graph on three uh, vertices for triangle. Correct, correct. Yeah, you're right. So the reason we're positioning, we're embedding into one dimension is because we have, you know, x is a, is a one dimensional variable, right? Um, and, and with triangle, yeah, totally. Look, here is your triangle. You'll have to put it, say, this is one, two, three, one, 
two, three. Here is connected. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Now, which means, in fact, that this spring will be very, very much straight, uh, very straightened out. So there will be a lot of energy in that spring, and which means it, it's very bad in terms of optimization. So if you have this triangle, the system will want it to be, you know, clamped together. But there are also sort of, you know, the, this notion of boundary constraints. And for example, we can attach one of the nodes to the side. There are a lot of sort of analogy you can build off. Um, we, we don't have a lot of time to go through this right now. But the point is, when you're embedding this into 1D, you're stretching out those springs. And imagine that you have, instead of this situation, imagine that you have, like, say, these three nodes. Then there is a connection with one node. And there is another sort of three nodes here. So what's going to happen when you try to embed them? These three nodes will want to be. These three nodes will want to be next to each other, and the next three nodes want to be next to each other, and there is this long connection. So it will be much better in terms of energy if you have if they need to be far apart to keep those three together and those three together and let them sort of drift apart on the weak connection and this is the whole point of, of the method all right so we, if we permute based on this <coughs> on the sorting of eigenvalues this is our original matrix this is a permuted matrix Permuted means the following. So we took an eigenvector, and we sorted it um, such a way that every value in eigenvector goes in increasing. And we use that permutation, and permutation means you know, changing of ordering, to actually permute the matrix. So if we calculated permutation P, here is a matrix APP from, from the permutation. And this is like sort of MATLAB notation. So what you're going to see here is you can actually notice that we almost have here this sort of block structure. There is this block and there is this block, which really corresponds to clusters in the graph. This example might not be the best in terms of you know, seeing this. I'll show you a little later on, on a bigger data um, how it can be seen. And in fact, this, this, sort of the this type of visualization, um, and in MATLAB, it's spy, and, and there is an analogous in Python. Um, allows you to see um, structure much, much better than, than you know, if you, if you use, um, if you, if even compared to even drawing graphs. I mean, and, and very often, let's say, you know, graph is, I don't know, 10,000 or 50,000 um, nodes. You can barely draw it, but you can clearly see this on the adjacency matrix visualization. And so when you do permutation, you might see clusters. I'll, uh, I'll show you in a second. But before we do that, there is something else to do. Well, there are lots of things to do. Um, one thing I just want to remind you that we did this graph cut, you know, there is ratio cut, normalized cut, quotient cut. And um, in fact, I, I showed you mathematics for um, this optimization, but I kind of weighed my hands and said that, well, you do exactly the same math and um, you solve a little bit different problem um, with this normalized cuts. And normalized cuts uh, will give you this eigenvector. And what you can do is, uh, you know, we, we, we looked at this eigenvector and we said, um, let me go back for a sec here. Um, we look at this eigenvector and, and we said, OK, um, we sort it. And we said, OK, well, you know, according to the theory, this is a split in two uh, partitions. But what we in fact could do is do the following. We could go, let's say, left to right through all the nodes, say this is our graph. So some connections. And we we ordered the nodes of the graph. That's what happened when we sorted eigenvectors. It means we ordered them. We could go left to right and start cutting the graph. We can cut it here. We can cut it there, we can cut it here, we can cut it here, 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 right? 
because they're ordered, now it's sort of a linear cutting problem. We don't have any more factorial number of combinations. It's just a linear number of combinations. We just go from left to right and just slice it, uh, you know, after the first node, after the, so we cut out the first node, we cut out first and second node, we cut out first, second, third node, we cut out first, second, third, fourth node, etc. It corresponds to going left to right on this picture. And for every of this sort of, <coughs> of, of for each and every of those cuts, we can actually calculate the real values of, for that cut, normalized cut, quotient cut. We can calculate all possible parameters. And here is, I, I did it. Um, this is a cut. This is normalized, a ratio cut, normalized cut, and this is uh, the, the conductance or quotient cut. And the way to understand these pictures, we're going left to right. And this is the value of that cut if I cut the graph at that location. So here, what's going to happen if we cut out the first node? That's the values of, of those metrics. If we cut out, say, the, 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 if I set up the cut at the node 10, this is the value of norm of ratio cut. This is the value of regular cut. This is the value of normalized cut. This is the value of the conductance. If I split the graph at node 10, so if every node from 1 to 9 belongs to the left side and from you know, 10 to the last one, to the right side. Now, this is not the original numbering. This is numbering reordered by eigenvector. The point of these pictures is to show you that within that reordering, the minimum occurs here. And pretty much on every, each and every metric, minimum occurs almost at the same spot, on the same node. So it gives you optimal split. And it also tells you that, OK, well, really, this, this conductance metric is probably one of the best metrics for, for cutting graphs because you know, look, look at the shape of this optimization function versus, let's say, very, very shallow shape here. If you actually done optimization, you realize that this is a much better function to, to, to work with. Now, again, I want to point out that this is done on already a sorted array, which means you know, we're not going through all the possible combinations. It's just we already sorted it using this, nor this normalized cut, and then we're just selecting the best place to split. And in fact, yes, the best place to split, according to all these pictures, is exactly where theory says, um, because that point corresponds to this location, right? This is vertex, I think, like 16 or 17. It's where the eigenvector jumps. It's, uh, on one hand, a proof that, 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 the, that mathematics work works. On the other hand, in real life, it's not always you know, that clear. Uh, it's not always that clean. You might want to do this, uh, go through this sort of um, procedure of, of finding the minimum. And you might also notice other interesting spots there. <clears throat> All right, I will let you sort of later on to look at those slides and, and think about it. We have like 10 minutes left, so I, I want to do a couple more things to sort of um, finish up on this topic. If you remember, <clears throat> A while ago, we talked about modularity, right? And the modularity was this notion of comparing the structure of, of the graph within the expected structure if we had a random connections within the, in between nodes. And uh, this is a summation, and, and uh, there is a Kronecker delta symbol, and it is equal to 1, which means we're calculating adding up on the edges that belong to the clusters. And we're not taking into account edges that are between clusters. And we did this modularity to calculate, for example, when we said, OK, well, um, you know, if, if the white people, uh, white kids are uh, friends with, with black kids, or you know, um, if there is any correlation between, <clears throat> say, you know, the, 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 the dorm where people live and what high school they went to, et cetera, et cetera. So we, look, we looked at, at those type of associations. Now, here is an idea. And actually, this idea was proposed by, by uh, Mark Newman um, in, in 2006 or 2007. This is a guy who actually came up with this modularity thing. So we can actually think about the classes as, as a partitioning graph into pieces. 
you know? And, and so there is nothing wrong about saying that, say, class, one class is the sort of V plus, the other is V minus, as we did with partitioning. Now, it's different in the sense that in graph partitioning, we calculated cuts and, and connections between and, and try to minimize cuts. Here, we will calculate this value of, of modularity that should be very high for, um, for clusters. So for in clusters, the modularity, because you know, connect, the assumption is that within the cluster, the connectivity pattern is <coughs> um, denser compared to random graph. So again, when we do partitioning, we looked at, um, at, at how the two pieces connected and looked at the density within versus density in between. When we do modularity, um, we're looking actually at the connectivity pattern versus the connectivity pattern of the random graph. So we're comparing it to random graph. Okay, the reason I'm talking about this is because, in fact, look, this is all written as a sums and written through matrices. So it's clear that you can probably play the same uh, trick as we did with normalized cuts to calculate those things. And in fact, yes, you can. Um, if you think about the same indicator variables as we defined previously, um, you can calculate this Kronecker symbol um, in the following fashion. Again, the idea is very simple. Think, look at this. If um, node i and node j belongs to the same partition, they're both equal to either one, and then this uh, value of this sum is one, one plus one, one half, which is one or they belong to minus one partition, they again, you multiply minus one times minus one is one plus one, gain one. Or if they belong to different partitions, it's gonna be minus one times one, which is minus one plus one will be zero. So it is just expression of Kronecker delta symbol, symbol using <coughs> indicator variable. Well, then you can write modularity the following way. I'm not gonna go into the details right now, you can sort of verify the math, but it's very clear, easy to show that if instead of Laplacian matrix, we introduce this matrix, Bij, which is Aij minus this, this is also a quadratic form in terms of indicator vectors. And then we can play the same trick. Um, indicator variables are also integers. Well, we relax, we'll replace them by axis, and we can calculate the modularity by doing um, the same sort of quadratic form optimization. The key difference here is the following. So what I just said is, okay, we need to optimize this. To optimize, we go from S to X, the same way as we did before. Uh, we also need to put some constraints that gives the quadratic optimization, Lagrange multipliers, solution is eigenvector. Now, the difference is this is not, you know, Laplace matrix. This is different matrix. And Look, this is eigenvector problem. Let's say we solved it. We substitute the solution back here. This is sort of the modularity that we're gonna get. Compared to <coughs> Laplace matrix and the problem that we did there, which was minimum cut, here we're looking for maximum modularity. We were looking for minimum, so back then, we're looking for the smallest eigenvalue. Here we are looking for maximum modularity. This is a modularity. For it to be the largest, we need to take maximum value of eigenvalue, maximum eigenvalue, and maximum eigenvector. But that's, a, that's, the, re, that's the only difference. Now, again, remember, matrix B is no matrix L, so it also, you also get this B. Um, it's A minus, what was that? Um, K, <clears throat> K, K transpose over to M. Uh, so it, it's, it's not the same as Lagrange matrix. It's not even close the same. Um, it's very different matrix. And instead of um, smallest eigenvalues, we're looking for the largest. But the technique of finding them is the same. It's a relaxation method, um, quadratic optimization, eigenvalues, eigenvectors. And, you know, pretty much, well, I'm going to skip this. Um, the algorithm is exactly the same. 
do adjacency matrix, class indicator vector, compute, <coughs> compute K, compute B. But now we're solving eigenvalue problem, but now we're looking for a maximal eigenvector, maximum eigenvalue, and assign S um, as a signed out. Um, this is an eigenvector, largest eigenvector computed uh, based on that metric. Again, um, the, the, the idea would be, all right, well, here is a split. So you know this is one class. Um, this is another class. Color them. OK. So pretty much got exactly the same split. Now, it's not going to be exactly the same split for a lot of graphs. This is just a very small example. And it's very clear here that you know we have there is this one cluster and there is a, another cluster. In many cases, it will, will be different. So these are two different methods. Um, we're optimizing very different criteria. In one case, we're optimizing this um, the minimum cut in between uh, parts of the graph. In other case, we're optimizing uh, we're comparing the density of of subgraphs to random graph, but we're using the same mathematical math method of actually optimizing things. And um, if you notice, the modularity score what happened? Joking. Continue. OK. And if you notice, um, the, the modularity, in this case, we measure modularity. Uh, it, it, it has the largest value for that split. So the modularity is the largest on that split. So again, for the cuts, we're doing minimum. For modularity, we're doing maximum. Now, there are actually quite a few critiques right now um, in the literature telling that this modularity um, might not work well on large graphs. Um, there are some reasons. You know, I'll, I'll give you references if you're interested. But it's you know the normalized cut works really well. Okay, two last slides. Slide number one. As I promised at the beginning, it would make sense when you do clustering at the very end to actually look at the density in the clusters. So what I show here is the following: we have a, a graph, and we can start splitting it into pieces. Again, it's sort of ordering based on <coughs> eigenvector. I go left to right, and I keep cutting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger part of the graph. And this is cluster number one, and this is cluster number two, what's left, right? right. So I'm sweeping from left to right. And I can calculate the density within the cluster. And this is the value of the density within the cluster, and density is defined by the number of um, edges by the maximum possible number of edges. And you know, when I cut just a little bit, there is a very high cluster density in one cluster. Now, I also define the density into, in, in the other cluster. So this is the density in the first cluster. This is the density in the second cluster. And I'm just sweeping it left to right. And what, you, what do you see? That the density on, in the first cluster reduces, density in the second cluster increases. So in some sense, if we had just one cluster, you know, you would be happier happiest here or, or, or there. But since we are splitting it into two pieces, you need to find somewhere a balanced place where the density of the clusters are higher than on average in the graph, right? but for both of them. And if you notice, those two lines intersect right there. And it's also pretty much the same split as we found before. So it's all very, very consistent. Now, one again, one point I want to sort of emphasize that I was able to draw this picture only after I did um, <coughs> the eigenvalue embedding or sort of normalized cuts procedure. Because to draw this picture, I need somehow to order the nodes in the graph. So I selected one particular ordering of the nodes through eigenvalues and eigenvectors. That allowed me to do the sweep. Otherwise, it will be n factorial sort of number of combinations. Okay, So this tells me that you know, what we do is quite reasonable. Sort of the generic graph density here in the graph is 0.13, so it's somewhere here. Yeah. And, and, and when we do our split here, or even if we do here or here, um, we still will be 
for both graph for, for both parts will have density higher than on average within the graph, which means they are clusters in, in our definition. All right, and the, and the final thought is, okay, well, we did you know split uh, in, in two parts. What you're going to do is in real life, if you want to detect clusters, you have to do multi-level. So you do split, then you do again, you know, then you work separately on this and separately on this, and you know you will eventually recover clusters. Here, what it looks like um, on a real graph. This is typically the matrix you're going to see. Uh, the, the data you're going to see if the numbering is random. What happens after that is you do spectral ones and you reorder nodes, you permute them, and you start seeing some structure. And most likely in this case, and I don't remember, but I think this was this kind of partition. Then you start working on this and you start working on this. You run spectral on, on this side and it gives you better permutation and you get this thing. Now here you get already sort of uh, <clears throat> several sub pieces and you start working separately on each of them. And um, after a bunch of sort of recursive steps, you get this. So this is the same data. The only thing that happened is bunch of permutations. And permutations are, are such a way that the nodes that are within the same cluster, they're numbered consecutively. And this happens through eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And, and you know, you cannot say there is any structure in, in, in the data here. But it's the same data, right? And what we did is we eliminated, we found the structure. And now it's pretty obvious, well, yeah, you have very strong cluster here, very strong cluster here, there, 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 there. And I think this data is like around 10,000 nodes by 10,000 um, nodes. So it's a pretty large graph, in fact. And it will be very, very hard to visualize any other way. So this is pretty much proof that this sort of multi-level spectral runs and works on, on, a, on a larger data. OK, that's pretty much it for today. Um, here are just a few classical uh, papers by Fiedler, um, Algebraic Connectivity of the Graphs. Um, this is sort of come back into high performance computing, uh, high performance computing people. Uh, this is a sort of very famous paper um, in um, computer computer vision um, by by Shea and Malik, um, and and this is a paper by Newman on modularity and community structure. And actually, I will add one more reference saying that this doesn't always work for large graphs. So the paper here. Okay, that's it for today. Um, that was a pretty intense lecture. Um, I strongly recommend you guys just go over math. It's not that hard, uh, but it, 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 it helps to you know, really sort of multiply those matrices and, and vectors uh, to understand how it works. And uh, the homework for the next time, Andre will, will give you, but it will be on spectral graph partitioning. Any questions? Okay. Well, uh, I'll be I'll be still in line when Andre starts seminar. So uh, feel free. Um, like a ten minutes break. Thank you.